Some of you may find what I'm about to say a bit absurd. Maybe a little silly, even. But this beam of light isn't actually changing direction. In certain scenarios, light may seem to change direction, but whether it's reflecting off a mirror, refracting through a medium, or being gravitationally lensed by a cluster of galaxies, the idea that the light itself is changing direction is a false one. Light naturally travels in a straight line throughout space. However, near massive objects like stars or black holes, space and time become curved. As a result, the straight path that light follows through this curved space-time appears to us as a bent trajectory. The light is still traveling in a straight line relative to the geometry of space-time, but because space-time itself is curved, its path seems altered when it's viewed from outside a curved region. Light that's reflecting off of something follows the same logic. It never really changes direction. Except in this case, it's not because of curved space-time. To understand why light that reflects off a mirror doesn't actually change direction, we need to look at both light and mirrors for what they really are. Imagine a single charged particle, like an electron. Because of its charge, it will have an electric field around it, and as long as this charge is motionless, this field will be static and unchanging. However, if we give this charge some motion, we'll observe that a magnetic field will form around it as it accelerates. Now, this isn't actually an electron, if you can believe it, but I do have access to real electrons using this device, called a cathode ray tube. When it's turned on, it generates a beam of electrons in a vacuum which accelerates from the cathode to the anode. According to James Maxwell's equations, these accelerating electrons generate a magnetic field around them in the clockwise direction. So by using a strong magnet, I should be able to deflect this beam. Since both the electric and magnetic fields can influence each other, we refer to them collectively as the electromagnetic field. These fields can exist independently though, as we saw with the stationary electron with a static electric field. However, when a charge accelerates, decelerates, or changes direction, the relationship between these fields become dynamic. A changing electric field generates a magnetic field, and a changing magnetic field generates an electric field. Because of this, any time a charged particle accelerates, the magnetic field that creates around it will distort the surrounding electric field, and that disturbance in the electric field then generates another magnetic field, and so on. These distortions of the electric and magnetic field, initiated by the moving charge, will propagate outward as electromagnetic waves, the waves we perceive as light. Since you're made up of charged particles, even waving your arm around will create electromagnetic waves. However, these are very low energy radio waves, far below the energy of visible light. The exact wavelength or color of light emitted by a charged particle depends on how fast it accelerates. Faster oscillations produce higher frequency waves with shorter wavelengths, while slower oscillations create lower frequency waves with longer wavelengths. It's kind of like shaking a ball on the surface of a pond, creating waves in the water, and the more energy you put into the motion, the shorter the resulting waves. Now, light in the visible spectrum happens to have a very short wavelength, so if you wanted to emit visible light by waving your arm around, you'll need to oscillate your arm at least 429 trillion times per second to emit red light, the longest wavelength in the visible spectrum. So, that's definitely not happening. Although, I have been practicing this motion a lot, so maybe I'll get there eventually. But while you can't emit visible light by moving your entire arm around, the individual molecules that make up your arm don't have nearly as much mass and inertia to overcome, so they're able to oscillate more freely. And since heat is just movement at a molecular scale, the heat from your body brings your molecules much closer to emitting visible light, which can be detected with an infrared camera. Assuming you're not hypothermic right now, the molecules in your body are oscillating around 30 trillion times per second. But the key to understanding reflection is realizing that these electromagnetic waves can transfer their energy to other charged particles, causing them to oscillate at the same frequency as the incoming wave. Almost everything around us is made up of charged particles, but materials like metals are especially good at reflecting light. Metals consist of the sea of delocalized electrons that aren't strongly bound to any particular atom, so they're free to move around the metallic lattice. These free-moving electrons are not only what allows metals to conduct electricity and heat so well, but they're also charged particles that light can interact with. When an electromagnetic wave encounters a free charge like an electron, the electric component of the wave will attract and repel the electron, causing it to oscillate in sync with the wave. And since electrons are charged particles, it will distort the electromagnetic field as it oscillates, re-emitting the same frequency light in almost all directions. With this in mind, let's consider a ray of light approaching the metal surface of a mirror. The ray will hit the surface at some particular angle to the normal, which is just an imaginary line perpendicular to the surface from the point of contact. The surface, of course, being made of metal, will have free electrons which oscillate in response to the approaching light. And these electrons will begin to emit light in almost all directions. In most directions, though, these waves are cancelled out due to deconstructive interference. Except for one direction, where the interference is constructive. This direction happens to be at an angle to the normal, which is equal to the incident ray's angle. So, light doesn't simply bounce off a mirror like a tennis ball or something. Instead, it's absorbed by the mirror, where it's briefly converted into the kinetic energy of electrons on the surface, and then re-emitted as a new wave. This is why mirrors are made using conductive metals with free electrons, like silver, 
However, for cost reasons, many modern mirrors use cheaper metals like aluminum, or dare I say, aluminium, for my illiterate viewers. So if light interacts with free electrons to reflect off of metals, then how can light reflect off of insulating materials, like glass? Unlike metals, the outermost electrons in glass are strongly bound to their respective atoms, so they're not free to move around the entirety of the glass. So when light encounters a piece of glass, rather than just the electrons on the surface oscillating, the entire atom the electrons are bound to will begin to oscillate. Thus, some light is generated and reflected by the glass. Even though these atoms are electrically neutral overall, the electric field of the light wave will interact with individual charges within the atoms. This interaction is strong enough to induce oscillations in the electrons and, to a lesser extent, the nucleus, because it is much heavier. Of course, not only does some light get reflected away from the surface, but the atoms will oscillate in such a way that most of the light gets re-emitted internally, continuing through the glass from atom to atom. Now, each time an atom absorbs light, there will be a very small delay before the light is re-emitted. And this accumulating delay makes the light appear to slow down as it moves through the glass. But really, each photon is traveling at the same speed it would in a vacuum, 186,000 miles per second. The overall wavefront of light does actually slow down as it passes through materials like glass, but this apparent change in speed is an emergent property of the glass itself, not a change in the properties of light. But not only does light appear to change speed as it moves through the glass, it also seems to change direction. As you may know, this is called refraction, and while I've explained that this process doesn't involve individual photons bouncing or changing direction, the overall wavefront of light does clearly change direction here. What I haven't fully explained yet is why this change in direction occurs. For that, you'll need to ask Christian Huygens, another man from history who is also mysteriously not alive today. Call me paranoid, but I think the government is up to something. But this dude was a Dutch physicist who came up with a model that doesn't exactly explain what light is, but it does accurately and beautifully explain how light propagates. Unfortunately though, the model is too complex for my animation abilities. So, pond scum. We're back to looking at pond scum, which is now frozen because I waited too long. So, I guess my only other option is theft. I'm going to use footage from Khan Academy, but don't worry, it's listed under Creative Commons, so it's ethical theft. Huygens proposed that every point on a wavefront of light can be thought of as a tiny secondary source of new wavelets, and as time moves forward, the envelope of these wavelets combine to form a new wavefront, and so on, like a continuous ripple moving through space. Using this visualization, you could see why light reflects at the same angle it arrives. Oh, hold on. Alright, there. Not coming after me. I'm good. But more importantly, you could also see how refraction works. Since these wavelets slow down while passing through a material, the new wavefront will shift, creating a change in direction. So yeah, shout out to Christian Huggins. Or yeah, he also invented the pendulum he also invented the pendulum clock. So yeah. 